So Bishop, if you don't mind, I would like to introduce you very briefly. So good evening once again, and it's my honor and privilege to welcome and introduce the most Reverend Mark Seitz into our midst as part of the Ignatian year. The most Reverend Mark Seitz, the sixth Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of El Paso. Bishop Seitz was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, was ordained a priest of the Diocese of Dallas in 1979 after receiving his BA in philosophy, as well as Master of Divinity and a Master in Theology from the University of Dallas. Bishop Seitz also received a Master in Liturgical Studies at St. John's University in Minnesota. After ordination, Bishop Seitz served as a pastor of parishes in Garland, Wasahatchee, and Dallas, Texas. He also taught liturgy and sacramental theology at the University of Dallas and served as vice rector and director of liturgy at Holy Trinity Seminary. Bishop Seitz was named prelate of honor to his holiness by St. Pope John Paul II in 2004. In 2010, Pope then Benedict XVI elevated Bishop Seitz to the office of the bishop. Bishop Seitz was ordained and appointed an auxiliary bishop of Dallas. In 2013, Pope Francis appointed Bishop Seitz as the sixth bishop of El Paso. As a prelate serving a borderland community whose sister city is Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, the bishop has focused his bishop and heart on the poor and vulnerable, including migrant families and refugees who have made their home in this region or who choose the community as their point of passage. The bishop believes the migrant add inestimable value to the communities where they choose to live and that parishes and community members should welcome them with compassion love and solidarity. In November of 2021, Bishop Seitz appointed and take office at the president of the Committee on Migration and Refugee Service in the U.S. Bishop Conference. Tonight, with my great honor and joy to welcome all of us to the most Reverend Mark Seitz presentation entitled, Migrating with the Migrant, the Rich Possibilities for Spiritual Accompaniment of the Migrant Poor. Bishop Seitz, thank you very much. This is a parish south of Dallas where I served for, for nine years, nine wonderful years in the country parish. So I'm really happy to be with you tonight and to, to share some thoughts. And I, I'd like to begin with a, a story that I hope will give you a little bit about where I'm coming from and in this work. Um, first of all, um, I wanna show you a family. Let's see, put it over here. There you go. As a parish priest, I would, uh, I had the opportunity to travel to Honduras to serve a sister parish there. The poverty was like nothing we in this country could imagine and, and the violence was pervasive. There was a member of the parish, Paulina, a person very committed to the church, a, a mother of five girls and a boy a beautiful but very poor family. The daughters were dynamic leaders of the youth ministry of the parish. Their father worked away from the family on the island of Roatan in the tourist industry. Sometimes they would receive money from him and other times the money was spent on beer before it could be sent to his family. Pauline had a 16-year-old daughter, Melba. One day, just before I was to return, 
Melba asked urgently to meet with me. Through tears, she asked me to bring her to the United States so she could work and support her family. To my frustration, there was nothing I could do for her. One day, Melba decided to make the journey on her own. She ended up in a detention center in South Texas, not far from where Sister Norma Pimentel serves there on the border. Perhaps you've heard of her. Norma, or rather Melba, called me from there, asking me to come help her, thinking that Dallas must be right next door to South Texas. I was able to find a chaplain who visited and helped her to find legal aid. Eventually, she was released to relatives in Florida. Melba had a younger sister, Yolanda, and a few years later, Yolanda also decided to come. By this time, I was already in El Paso as bishop. One day, out of the blue, I received a call from Yolanda. She was now 24 years old. She had crossed the border and was in, in detention in El Paso. She had crossed over from Ciudad Juarez. She was alive, thank God, but she had a harrowing trip. Her husband, back in Honduras, was a member of a narco-trafficking gang, and he abused her and threatened their four children. She decided to escape and find a way to bring her children as soon as she could. On the journey, she had been sexually assaulted, and she traveled part of the journey in the luggage compartment of a bus, constantly inhaling the fumes. She escaped and made it through the nightmare of the desert all the way to our border. But after having escaped from criminals in her home country and on the way here in the land where she hoped she would be safe, she was treated like a criminal and put behind bars in immigrant detention. Although I had always had concerns for those who were arriving at our border, it was more from a distance. This and other experiences like it with others helped me to come to know this reality in a different way. It changed me. My love for them changed me. Now it was personal. Now the people who endured these unimaginable hardships were not abstract numbers. They were my friends. They were my sisters, brothers. Oh, Señor, no seamos sordos a tu voz. Que, seam, que no seamos sordos a tu voz. Please, Lord, help us to hear. I'd like to share a passage with you from the book of Deuteronomy. It tells the story of the exodus of the people of God from Egypt. As God tells them how they are to recall the events of their salvation, how they are to remember how God helped them to escape from the slavery of Egypt, where they were oppressed and abused. God wants them to remember every year what he had done, and to, in a certain way, relive it so that they wouldn't forget, so they'd always keep before their eyes the reality of what God had done for them. And he says that when they gather and share the Paschal Lamb, then you shall declare in the presence of the Lord your God, my father was a refugee 
Aramean, who went down to Egypt with the small household and lived there as a resident alien. But there he became a nation, great, strong, and numerous. When the Egyptians maltreated and oppressed us, imposing harsh servitude upon us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our cry and saw our affliction, our toil and our oppression. Then the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and outstretched arm, with terrifying power, with signs and wonders, and brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've always found that phrase in the beginning of that passage so fascinating. There's to recount their history by saying, my father was a, in this translation, refugee Aramean. But that's, the, wait, that's the translation we use at Mass on Sunday. It's the New American Bible. A refugee Aramean. We were resident aliens in the land where we were. And what does it mean? It means that there were a people with no home, a people who didn't belong any place, a people that were not a people because they were just a mishmash of oppressed peoples. The only thing they held in common really was their slavery. And somehow, in the wonder of God's love, he looked upon them and saved them and made them a people and gave them a place where they could live in safety. That was um, like 1,200 years before Christ, I believe, they say. They say. I guess God's been doing this a long time. We go to the next slide. So we do well to ask, how is God at work today? What is God doing in the midst of our history, in the midst of our time in which we live? Who is the Pueblo today? Who are the people that God is reaching out to in his love and mercy? In the time of Moses, the place where the people of Israel were living had become, become unlivable due to the impression of the leaders of Egypt who had forgotten how the exiles from Palestine had contributed to their well-being during times of famine through that exile named Joseph, the Palestinian slave. In our time, our entire nation, our government seems to have forgotten that our country became a great nation when immigrants came here from all corners of the world and became part of this unique experiment in nation building. By no means can we say it was done totally right or well. Obviously, there were significant ways in which we fell short. And yet, at least there was this dream, this ideal, this vision that moved our nation forward and helped our founders to understand that we would only be a great nation if we came together we brought together people who were suffering and we made them our own. In the 1880s, a beautiful statue, a gift from France was placed in New York Harbor. At her base was a, a poem. It stated, a mighty woman with a torch. And you can go to the next slide. A mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, mother of exiles, 
From her beacon hand glows world, worldwide welcome. And the next, further on, Lady Liberty boldly proclaims, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp before the golden shore. Lady Liberty, in that poem at her base, captures our nation's best self understanding. I see somos, o debemos ser. We are a place that welcomes those whose lives are unlivable in their homelands and offer them a land of promise where they can reach their full potential, even as they make our nation to be a light for the world. What is Egypt today? What are they fleeing and what is their destination? Well, many people today do not have the slightest idea, people in our country, in the United States, don't have the slightest idea of the conditions under which people just south of our border live. They live in places in which criminal organizations, narco-trafficking gangs have more money, more weapons, and more power than the government. They act with impunity, killing and raping, and extorting businesses. Young people may manage to study, but when they're educated, there is no option for making a living unless it's working for the gang. If we ask who the Egypt is today, then we can ask who is the Moses? Oh, but for a Moses in our day, who is it that will step up and speak to pharaohs of our day and help those who have no voice and no hope to find a place of freedom and peace? And what might we, on the other hand, learn from this pilgrim people of our own time? Of course, the reality of immigration in our time does not begin when people on the move arrive at our border. The church teaches that people have a right to migrate when their life and that of their family is at risk. But the church also teaches that there is a prior right. That is to be able to stay where they live and to prosper in peace where they live. So often, immigration issues are boiled down in the minds of people to a border issue, right? It's just like, it, it only happens in this line that we've drawn in the sand. If, and then of course, the answer seems simple. If you, want to, you know, if you want to manage immigration, you just build a high enough wall, have enough soldiers and whatever to stop them, and then you've handled immigration. But the truth is, brothers and sisters, that immigration is not simply a border issue. The border is where we see the consequences of our short-sighted and unjust policies. That's where we see it lived out. But if you really want to understand immigration and you really want to work to make it and more, more orderly and just, then you have to look well beyond borders to where people live and ask why they're leaving. And you need to look inland to the destinations of people and find out how they're being received, how they're being served. It's not just a border issue.
you go to the next slide. In October, in October, I had the opportunity to go down to Tegucigalpa, Honduras. One day we got into a four by four and headed up into the hills on the peripheries of the capital. Higher and higher we climbed on rutted dirt paths. The higher we went, the more flimsy the construction. We had to work our way around tanker trucks carrying water because that was the only way they could get water in their houses by paying for it, tanked to their house. Up and up we went for more than 20 minutes into a place controlled by gangs. Fortunately, we were with some religious sisters and the sisters knew the gangs. The gangs knew the sisters. They didn't mess with them. We met a group made up primarily of mothers. Few men, the few men that are, are there, very few, uh, and even very few young women. We were told that 80% of the young men had left the country to escape the recruiting efforts and threats of the gangs. So there's this big gap. There are middle-aged and elderly people, especially women and young children. And these women showing the kind of perseverance and hope that you'll only find, I think, in people who have suffered much had gotten together. They organized and built that school that they showed us with pride. And they started a co-op store with the help of the church. And they built a church for the people. The group with which we met, celebrating the Eucharist, quite an inspiration to me. You go to the next slide. And so you've seen, you, we who live here near the border are familiar with these kinds of scenes. I'd like to tell you about someone else who taught me a lot. about the faith and endurance of people on the border, people who are on the move. You'll go to the next slide. That girl with the beautiful smile is nine-year-old Cecia. She and her family had worked her way up, as it happens, from Honduras. And um, they had survived more than one kidnapping attempt as they waited in Honduras. She had, Cecia was the eldest, she had a little brother about six and a little sister about four. Her little sister and her mother both had heart conditions. The four-year-old had had surgery as a child and was in need of follow-up care. While they were waiting under MPP, the Migrant Protection Protocol, she had had another minor heart attack. We went down across the border, a group of us with a lawyer that was working on their case. And we said, we've just got to try and get these people across. They're, they'll be dead. At least this little girl will, if things go on like this. So we went across and um, met a group of people there. We, uh, there was actually a group of Cuban men who were there. One man's face, was, eye was black and blue and so on. He said that he had been beaten up on the streets the night before. 
desperate to get across as he left the dictatorship of Cuba. We prayed with the family and then we decided to walk and see if we could find some compassion in the hearts of those who guard our border. I was trembling because I didn't know what was going to happen, you know, uh, I knew that my situation was a lot better than theirs, but things were pretty tense. As we started walking, Cecia took my hand. And we said to each other, let's make this a parade. And somehow some you know, she gave me the courage uh, to move forward, you know, and we worked our way up the bridge and confronted the uh, CBP there, Border Patrol. And there was a long standoff and request for the supervisor and so on. We didn't know what was going to happen. Tensions were high on both sides. And um, just when we thought perhaps they were gonna chase us back, they said, come across. And they allowed the family to come. That, that story doesn't end there, but um, it would probably take too long to tell you the rest of it. The good news is right now they are living with sponsors and um, Indiana, and I believe, and I think they're doing pretty well from, from what I know. So, well, I know that um, I've taken pretty much my half hour. I could go a lot more, trust me. Uh, there's a lot more I'd love to share. But let me just conclude by by saying, you know, a lot of people think even if they come to the point of recognizing the humanity and the need of our migrant brothers and sisters, that they can, that perhaps they should try to do something to help them. What I've come to see is that the truth is that if you get involved and you come to know people who are on the move, they're going to help you. They're going to reveal to you possibilities for a life of faith that go beyond what you might have imagined. They're going to reveal to you a goodness, a charity, a love that only they can teach us. They're going to not need us to guide them as we will need them to guide us to the kingdom of God. Thank you very much.